All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining for our, our second installment here of the Ecclesiastes series, Meaningless Wisdom. Uh, so it will be up on the website then. Bobby, are you still talking? I can't hear you. Yeah, I think we lost him again. Oh, we lost Bobby? Yeah, no. you're frozen, Bobby. Uh, well, all right, Tom, you want to do the honors then? Hey, guys, sorry about that. Oh, there he is. My, my internet kicked out, and unfortunately, we had issues with the recording last week. Um, but this time, we should be good to go. We will see. We're so glad that you're here and joining us for the second meaningless wisdom a study of ecclesiastes tonight we're going to get the honor of hearing from neil farley uh, who's done an incredible job preparing this material and uh, i'm so excited that we're going to get to kind of hit the real meat and potatoes of ecclesiastes this week uh so we'll go to god in prayer and then uh neil will take us away dear god thank you for the, the ways that you buddy thank you so much for the ways that you shape our lives for us and that you uh, are continually offering us wisdom and direction uh, and hope. Uh, God, please be with Neil tonight as he speaks to us and teaches us uh, about your word. Uh, help us to be inspired uh, by what we hear and learn uh, and help us to continually uh, allow our, our thinking to be reshaped uh, by what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, yeah, thanks, Bobby, for that um, introduction and prayer. Um, welcome, everybody, to um, this second class in the series, Meaningless Wisdom, Study of Ecclesiastes. Um, I'm going to, um, so for those of you, maybe a few of you uh, were not at last week's class, and um, so I'm just going to do a little review um, Bobby did an amazing job. Um, these, uh, you know, Bobby's shoes are uh, always very big shoes to fill. So I hope I can, uh, you know, do an adequate job filling those shoes. Um, but it's going to be difficult. Uh, his his class last week was great on um, just giving us some introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes and how to read it. And so I just wanted to kind of go across uh, over a few things. The first one was just this sort of... Um, it's been a, almost a proverb that every interpreter of this book thinks that all previous interpreters have been wrong. And um, I'm not really going to say that I think everybody's wrong um, and that I'm right. Uh, I certainly am not going to say that. Uh, so this is, you know, Ecclesiastes is a, is a tough book. And, um, you know, it was it was not easy to, um, to really get meaning from this class uh, uh, or for this class. Um, he talked about um, the context of uh, Ecclesiastes in wisdom literature, uh, wisdom literature being Job, uh, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, Song of Psalms. So, you know, songs, Psalms and Song of Songs are more poetry, but that is how Ecclesiastes sort of fits in this canon of uh, wisdom literature. Um, wisdom literature, um, Bobby told us, is more philosophical in nature. Asking the big questions um, provides general truths, not always biblical promises. And we had a great Q and A last week where we we talked about some of that. Um, talked about the goads and the gifts. You know, it gives you some things to really like, kind of wake you up and make you think, and also some really encouraging things as well. Um, Bobby discussed the idea of that Ecclesiastes is a frame narrative. So um, if you look, I think it's um, chapter one, verse one and 12 is sort of like this narrator as well as um, the, the latter part of chapter 12. And there's also a little piece in chapter seven where it's a narrator speaking. And then the rest of it is this uh, person named the the Koheleth with, uh, which is actually, uh, 
also translated teacher, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But the so the middle part is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know what the teacher was talking. Uh, you know what the teacher had said and some of the things that he said. Um, uh, Bobby also talked about biblically normative teaching, which is something that I don't think I'd ever heard of. Um, but basically what that means is that not every word in the Bible is meant to be direct instruction to us. And that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, when you think about some things like, for example, in the book of Job, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, um, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, that doesn't sound like something that we want to follow in, in the Bible. Um, but as long as we read all scripture in context of all other scriptures, and we read all scripture in the context of Jesus and his teachings, um, then we should be able to understand those sort of difficult passages that kind of don't seem to make sense. Um, Bobby also gave you guys a homework assignment, and um, that was to read Ecclesiastes straight through. Uh, and to reflect on where you seek meaning. And so I hope that um, most of you, if not all of you, got to do that. And uh, and I'm going to actually uh, ask you a question based on your reading So in a minute. So we'll see who actually did their homework. No, just kidding. Um, all right. So this class is called uh, Ecclesiastes in Context. So in other words, again, trying to put those kind of you know, the middle part of Ecclesiastes, which has a lot of, you know, really troublesome, you know, Bobby, I think mentioned, you know, confusing, uh, concerning <laughs> passages in sort of some sort of context uh, with the rest of the Bible. So as you were reading the book of Ecclesiastes, you probably said, huh, a bunch of times, right? Um, so today we'll look at some of those passages that don't seem to fit in the Bible and how we can interpret them in the context of all scripture and Jesus teaching. Yeah, I know I just said that. All right, so we'll start with Ecclesiastes uh, chapter one, and we will read verses one through 11. It says, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So you're like, really? What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So again, pretty um, pretty meaningless, right? Pretty uh, pretty bleak. Some of this things that he's saying. So, um, but let's break this down a little bit. So first of all, this word meaningless that we see as meaningless in the NIV and some other translations um, is the word, the Hebrew word hebel, um, and it's used thirty-eight times in the book. Of Ecclesiastes. Now, other translations of the word hebel in the Bible are um, vanity, um, smoke, vapor, temporary, fleeting, enigma, paradox. Um, but at least according to the commentary that Bobby had um, recommended to you guys last week, um, I was reading through that, and they said that you know, meaningless actually seems to be pretty good translation in most cases. Even again, the, I think the King James uses vanity. Um, it it seems to fit pretty well. Um, another phrase that's used a lot is the phrase under the sun, which is used 29 times. And basically the phrase under the sun um, is just what it sounds like. You know, it's anything under the sun and not above. So it's basically the world apart from God. And so we're going to see really um, in a lot of cases in the 
book of Ecclesiastes, it's talking about, you know, the, the teacher is talking about life apart from God. And that's why some of this is so problematic to us is because we're used to reading the Bible as, you know, with God. So this is kind of taking God out of the equation in some cases. So, um, so the, the teacher, the Koheleth, um, performs an experiment in chapters one and two. Um, and he tried to find meaning in many things under the sun. Now, here is the, um, here is the, the homework, or, or not the homework, but um, so if, if those of you guys who read through the book of Ecclesiastes, maybe you can jot some of the things in the chat, or what were some of the things that he tried to find meaning under the sun and found meaningless? So I'm going to look in the chat here. Okay, wisdom, excellent. Hard work, excellent work. Projects. Maybe nature. Okay, wine and folly. I've always loved the word folly for some reason, I'm not sure. Pleasure. Possessions, materialism, gold and silver. I'll give you guys another 30 seconds to. Education. Excellent. All right, singers, a harem, maybe entertainment, yeah. All right, good. So what we'll do now is, so I'm going to, a lot of the, the things I'm going to address in this class are those things that you already wrote in the chat. So that's, that's great that you guys uh, remember those things. Um, and remember, after his experiment, what was his conclusion? Vanity of vanities, meaninglessness of meaninglessness, uh, hebel of hebels. I mean, it's really meaningless, okay? So some of the things that the Kohela deems meaningless that we're going to talk about, um, the first one is time, toil. I think, you know, somebody said work, wisdom. Somebody said wisdom. Um, I'm going to talk about justice. I don't think anyone mentioned that. Riches and pleasure, certainly people mentioned that. And I'm also going to talk about death. And, um, and these are all things that he comes to the conclusion are meaningless. And um, so let's see what he has to say and how we can interpret those things in the context of the rest of the Bible. So let's talk about, uh, first about time. Um, in that last passage that we read, it says that generations come and go. Now, this Word generations, we think of, you know, maybe like a genealogy or something like that. But generation can also just mean the cycles of, of life. You know, like, you know, the sun keeps going around and, you know, you had another trip around the sun. It's, a, it's your birthday again. And um, my, my dad used to tell of his, his grandmother used to say um, every Christmas uh, they would get together. You know, as soon as they would sit down, she'd be like, you know what? Before you know it, this is going to be over, you know. And so that just really occurred to me as, as uh, you know, kind of hebel in this sense. Um, the wind blows north to south. You know, I, I, I feel so sad for those, you know, people who live in these hurricane um, areas, like in Florida and some of the islands. You know, they 
they build this house and then a, the hurricane comes in and knocks it down and then they've got to rebuild it. And, you know, five years later, maybe there's another hurricane knocks it down. And it's kind of like, you know, it seems like, you know, like meaningless in the sense of, you know, it, again, if you're, <laughs> if you're trusting in your house as your, as your God, then it's going to be meaningless, you know? says our eyes and ears never get enough in in one eight um man in this day and age that is more true than ever right you can there's just so much information coming at us left and right 24 hour news you know instagram twitter you name it and um, our eyes and ears never get enough you know you go down the street see all the billboards it's just um there's nothing new under the sun in, in one nine, um, you know, and, and, and that is true, you know, even like as much as things change, they, they stay the same. Right. And then he says, no, nobody, basically nobody will remember me when I'm gone. And that's kind of, you know, that is kind of true. Right. I mean, with the rare exception, I'm sure there's a few people in this room, maybe in a hundred years that will be remembered. Um, but most of us in a hundred years, uh, Neil, who? What? No. So, um, so yeah, we are probably not going to be remembered. And again, he finds this as meaningless. You know, this doesn't. You know, it's it's just it's absurd, absurdity. So, um, now what's kind of cool is in most cases we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be um, finding meaning from these things in context of other you know scriptures in the Bible. But it's kind of cool that the Koheleth actually sort of interprets himself and puts himself into context here in chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. He says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do uh, good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. So just going back to that, I, you know, where it says he has said eternity in the human heart. So, you know, none of the things on earth, like all those things that we mentioned already and that we're going to be talking about, are really meant to make us, to give us meaning and satisfaction. Um, and the reason for that is God has set eternity in our hearts. And, um, you know, I was, I was talking to my wife about this, uh, about my class, and, you know, I was, you know, I was kind of asking her that question. So why, why don't these things make us happy? Why don't they give us true meaning? And she right away said, because God has put eternity in the hearts of men. And I thought, wow, I should look for that scripture and, and use it in my class. And she's like, I think it's in Ecclesiastes, hon. And I looked it up and sure enough, I just had missed it. So, um, but anyway, she said that was one of her favorite scriptures and it, it's so great, right? Um, he also talks about in the, in the previous passage, um, I didn't read it just because it's, you know, for time's sake, but this is a very famous passage that everybody's probably heard that, you know, there's a time and a season, there's a time to laugh and time to cry. Um, so, you know, time is, there's a time for everything, um, but things under the sun will not satisfy us, right? So as long as we are looking for our meaning without God, nothing's going to satisfy us because he's put eternity in our hearts. Um, it's been said that every human being has a God-shaped hole inside of them. And um, I found this quote uh, from Blaise Pascal, a philosopher from the 60s, the 1660s, that is. Um, and he wrote in his book, The Penzies, I don't know how you pronounce that, but he said, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim, but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, with God itself. 
God himself. So um, I'll give you a minute to think about that. That's a pretty deep um, um, quote there. But basically, it's just saying the same thing that God says, is that he has put eternity in our hearts. And nothing can fill that except for an infinite God. And then in um, chapter 1, verses thir uh, verse 13, he talks about the gift. So um, we already mentioned that if we look under the sun for meaning, everything's meaningless. But if we realize that everything's meaningless apart from God, then we can actually enjoy everything in life as a gift from God. So, and that kind of turns everything around, you know, because certainly we know that the things that we're going to be talking about cannot give us ultimate satisfaction and meaning. But if we look at them as God's gift, then we're going to look at a lot of ways that they can, um, you know, be really encouraging and, and just be, um, you know, be really satisfying to us. Um, you guys have all heard the uh, phrase carpe diem, I bet, right? And for those of you who are older, like um, like myself and Tom Hughes, um, you guys probably um, have seen this movie if you're older. And I'm just going to play a short clip. This is one of my favorite movies uh, called Dead Poets Society. Mr. Pitts. It's a rather unfortunate name. Mr. Pitts. Where are you? Mr. Pitts. Will you open your hymnal to page 542? Read the first stanza of the poem you find there. Did the virgins to make much of time? Yes. That's the one. <laughs> Somewhat appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Now, who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That ceased the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No. Ding. Thank you for playing anyway. Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. I'd like you to step forward over here and peruse some of the faces from the past. You've walked past them many times. I don't think you've really looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. But if you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? Um, okay, so that, whoops, let me get back to my slides. How do I do this? Now, Mr. Now. Okay, so um, now, first of all, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll say that that, that, um, that movie is, you know, kind of a very humanistic take on 
carpe diem. And, you know, the whole idea there was, you know, you find meaning in life and, you know, expressing yourself and in, in art and things like that. And again, if, if that's how you're trying to find your meaning in life, um, all the carpe diem in the world will be meaningless. However, I think God actually um, has the same uh, idea in Ephesians 5, uh, 15 to 20. It says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll call this God's carpe diem, right? Um, first of all, he says, make the most of the time. And let's face it, we, we all have a limited amount of time. And, you know, we, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to thousands of other things, right? Um, and so, you know, make the most of the time, choose the important things. Don't, you know, don't get bogged down with the things that don't matter. Um, now, this isn't, you know, YOLO. My, my kids, when they were little, they used to like, YOLO, dad, YOLO. And I was like, what does that mean? You only live once. So, you know, and so we're not talking about just, you know, have a blast or just just have fun because you're going to be food for worms. But it's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what um, really makes the difference. Now, um, just want to remind you guys a, a couple a couple months ago, we had our, our Holy Spirit series. And I stole this slide from Tom Hughes's excellent message on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so he was talking about, um, you know, how can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, just to go back, I mean, we're, we're initially, we receive the Holy Spirit, you know, Acts 2.38, when we're baptized um, for the forgiveness of our sins, we receive the Holy Spirit. Um, however, you know, we can have this continuous um, indwelling or, or um, receiving the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit, um, you know, by, by doing things and by, you know, I've heard it said, you know, we by by doing some of these things, we kind of make space in our hearts for God to fill it. You know, things like meditation, reading your Bible, praying, fasting, um, all these different things that are on this list here. Um, and you know, the fill it, the Holy Spirit is what will fill that God-shaped hole, right? The Holy Spirit, um, if we allow the Holy Spirit into our heart, it will fill that hole. Uh, he will fill that hole. And um, and so, again, if we are trying to fill our hearts with things like, you know, the things we're talking about tonight, um, we're going to feel like it's meaningless. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our heart, then these other things will seem like a gift from God. Um, I want to focus actually on one, though. I just want to share from um personal experience uh one of the things so as tom went through that list um one of the things you see there is uh is silence and the bible says in habakkuk 2 20 the lord is in his holy temple let all the earth be silent before him and um i had actually if you looked at the the subheading of that uh or the the bottom of that slide it mentioned a book by uh, Richard Foster, Celebration of Disciplines. One of my favorite books. I've read it like ten times. And whenever I read the or read the chapter on silence and solitude, I always thought, you know what? I'll you know that's not. I don't. I'm not feeling. That doesn't really resonate with me, because I, I'm the kind of person that always pretty much has something playing. If I'm in the car, I've got a podcast or I've got a, a book on tape that I'm listening to. Even when I go to bed, uh, ask my wife, I have my earphone in my ear because it puts me to sleep and I'll you know be listening to a book or something like that. I'm out doing my um, garden, you know, my yard work. I have my headphones in listening to a book or a podcast. And it's like I, for some reason, I just don't enjoy, I didn't enjoy, um, you know, just being by myself and, and being quiet. There's a quote that says, you know, most of the problems in the world happen because people are not happy sitting alone in a room by themselves. And um, so 
what I've what I've been trying over like maybe the last month or so is I, I I've been doing my little experiment, right? And so I've basically just turned off my um, you know, I don't play anything. So I drive to work, I have about an hour commute each way. And I I just drive to work in complete silence. And so I've been practicing this, practicing this discipline. Now, this isn't my prayer time. I, you know, I I try to pray before or after that time. I usually write in a prayer journal. This is just pure silence. And sometimes I'm praying. Sometimes I'm praying. Um, sometimes I'm just complete silence. So I almost think of it as like I have God and, you know, sitting next to me. And sometimes I'm talking to him. Sometimes he's talking to me. Sometimes we're just sitting there and just enjoying the ride. And, um, and you know, same thing, like when I go to bed, I, I really haven't been, you know, listening to like a book or, or even when I'm doing my yard work, I just kind of go out and just do the yard work. And, and um, it's really made a huge difference. Like I've just, you know, cause this idea of creating space for God to fill you, I mean, there's just so much noise in the world. I talked about that before. Um, you know, maybe for you, it's, you know, your, your phone, you're always, um, you know, checking your phone. Like, you know, I, I read somewhere that people check their, touch their phones like 200, 2000 times a day or something like that. I don't know what that means exactly in terms of what they count as a touch, but, um, but, you know, there's kind of like an epidemic of, of noise and busyness that we have in, in, in this world right now, you know, because of all the technology. So, um, I would just, you know, recommend, you know, maybe for you, it's, you know, turn off your phone for a, a day or, you know, 12 hours or something like that. Or maybe it's, um, you know, do what I did is, you know, just, uh, to, you know, where you would normally be listening to something, just let it be quiet and see if it makes a difference. It might make a difference. It's made a big difference for me. I just feel kind of a lot calmer. I definitely feel closer to God. I feel um, you know, that he is speaking to me more through his word and it's, it's, it's been great. So give it a try and also just enjoy the small things in, in life, you know, the gifts, like the little gifts that you don't think of as gifts. Like the other day I was, I picked up my dog and I was just, you know, petting my dog and I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You know, today my, um, my wife and I, we went to the, to the beach and I was just sitting there and I was just like, watching this bird eating like uh, whatever he was eating, like a crab or something like that. I was just like, this is so cool. So just, you know, enjoying those little small things in life. And again, if if I'm sitting at the beach and thinking this is what's going to give me meaning in life, it's going to be meaningless. But if I'm enjoying this as something God has made and God has given me, it can be pretty great. So, um, all right. So the second thing uh, we talked about was toil. And so I'm going to read in chapter two, verses 17 to 22. It says, so I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all of the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I've poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. And in 4.4, it says, then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, chasing after the wind. So, um, you know, first of all, he's talking about, you know, I hate my job. I hate my life. And I was talking to somebody I know very well <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying, yeah, I really hate my job. And since I spend so much time in my job, I feel like I'm going to hate my life. So I was saying, wow, maybe you really, you know, need to <laughs> look for a new job. Um, now, there's two possibilities here. Either some people their job is their God, you know, and they put their job before everything. They're, they're so motivated to excel in their career. Um, they let that crowd, even Christians. I mean, all these things we're talking about, let's face it, you know, people in the world under the sun try to find meaning, but unfortunately we as Christians do the same thing a lot of times, you know? So sometimes even as Christians, you know, we might be trying to find our true meaning in our job, um, not with God. Um, but some of us might need to try to find a new job. I know for me, I had a job that I really didn't like, and it kind of made me miserable. And so I eventually uh, had the opportunity to get a new career. Um, and, you know, I've been teaching for the last 26 years, and I love it. And so, um, 
you know, that was a great, great move. So um, in terms of envy, you know, he talks about envy being a motivation for, for, for performance, you know, um, maybe some of you guys in your career, you know, it's all about, you know, like as a teacher, we really, you know, unless you want to become like the principal, which I don't, um, there's not a lot of, you know, <laughs> it's not like trying to climb the corporate ladder, but for a lot of you, like, you know, maybe finding meaning means, you know, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, getting promoted and, um, and, you know, it, maybe you envy somebody who, who got the promotion that you didn't get, you know? And if, um, again, if you're, if you're looking for your job as your meaning, it can be pretty discouraging, right? When somebody else keeps getting promoted and you don't, um, uh, and also this idea of inheritance, you know, you're giving your stuff to somebody else and they might not take care of it. Well, there's a great scripture over, um, and I'm pretty sure most of you guys know the scripture in Colossians chapter three, um, 23 and 24 it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So again, whether it's a job that you love and it's tempting, you know, it's it's tempting you to make it your God, or whether it's a job you don't like and until you find a new job, um, you know, our time at work can be really worship time if we're work, you know, we're working for God. Um, you don't have to think of it as as drudgery or um or even you know this is how i get my meaning um if we're working for god we won't envy our neighbors you know you can rejoice with those who rejoice if if your friend gets the promotion and you didn't you know you can rejoice with them i know it might still hurt but um if you rejoice with them it'll probably um be encouraging for you um again you might want to change job or careers at some point in your life um if god you know seems like that's what he's saying. And again, don't worry about who receives your inheritance because in Colossians there, it says you will receive an internal inheritance from God, right? So, you know, once you're gone, you don't really care. If you're, if you're a Christian, you don't really care who has your, who has your stuff, right? Okay. Um, the next one, uh, the next thing that Kohela themes meaningless is wisdom. And um, in verse chapter one, verses 12 to 14, he says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, chasing after the wind. And now, first of all, let's, let's just say worldly wisdom or, or learning will never satisfy us. Um, you know, in First Corinthians eight one, it says um, knowledge puffs up. Now it's great to know some facts, and it's good to be educated. I'm not saying that, but we'll never know everything. So if you are one of those know-it-all people that has to know everything and keep up with, you know, Bobby gave us the the verdict on that. You know, he said that in the time he taught his class last week, and I think the same would be true for this class. Um, like. 10,000 YouTube videos are being put up with all kinds of new information, right? So you can't keep up, right? Um, somebody always knows more than you do, right? And um, so if that's what you're looking for meaning is your knowledge, it's going to be meaningless for sure. Um, James 3 talks about wisdom in 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. So we see here that godly wisdom 
leads to humility. Godly wisdom is not the type of wisdom that tries to show up people and to you know boast about how smart you are and that kind of thing, right? Um, we can use our knowledge for God. I mean, I think it's good to be you know informed about things um, because it can lead to great conversations with people. You can build friendships and and that kind of thing. But if you're the type of person who's always like you know trying to show up people about how how well you know, it's you know going to kind of turn turn them off. Um, here's a little plug for students, right? Doing well in school gives glory to God and will help your evangelism, not hinder it, right? If um, if you're trying to reach out to somebody and you know, you're know you barely passing your class that you're in with them and they're doing really well and you say, hey, come to my church. I want to you know teach you how to have a better life. And they're like, yeah, but you have like a 66 average in this class. Um, that might not be as compelling as if you're doing your best. Now, if you're doing your best and you're getting a, you know, a, a poor grade, then God will use that. But if you're if you're slacking, um, then you know, you get it right. Bobby's going to talk uh, a lot more about wisdom next week, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, next one is justice. Um, the Kohelet deems justice meaningless, and um, in chapter four, verses one to three, says, again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all are those who are not yet born, for they have not seen all the evil that is done under the earth. So this is one of those, huh? Um, but, you know, the, the thing about the Kohelet is that he almost seems resigned to injustice. He doesn't seem to think that there's anything we can do about it. And, you know, in fact, so much so that it's better off, you're better off dead than living because then you won't see all the injustice. But we know that God's heart is a heart of justice. Um, if you read Psalm 89, verse 14, that's basically what it says. Um, and the cool thing in, in my day, like, well, let's say when I was in, in, you know, like back in the 80s, like when I was kind of growing up and going to college, they called that the me generation. And I think the generation today, the millennials and whatever they call them now, um, are are kind of rebelling against that you know this this selfishness they're they're much more into causes and and serving you know serving and charity and and you know the environment and all this stuff and that's that's really awesome but guess what if that's what you're finding using to find meaning in your life you know what the answer is right um without god pursuing justice is still going to be meaningless now it's maybe one of the better ways to be meaningless, but guess what? It's still meaningless. <laughs> and um, but the cool thing is that you know those people who have a heart to help people are oftentimes you know maybe soft-hearted people who might be uh, might want to get to know God. So you can use that. So now the the reason that Christians need to pursue justice though is not to find meaning. It's because Jesus pursued justice. If you you know read. Um, you know, through the Gospels, that's what Jesus uh, was all about. And, you know, this idea of bringing, you know, Jesus said we should pray, God, please um, um, bring uh, our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> Give us this day. You know what I mean? Um, earth as it is in heaven. So um, let your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. And, um, you know, so we really by by, you know, by pursuing justice are bringing more of the kingdom to earth. You know, the kingdom will not fully be on earth until Jesus comes back, but we're called to bring the kingdom more and more into earth, you know, and speed his return. Um, James chapter 127, um, this is a scripture that Bobby read last week, but pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So truly, um, if we're not involved with justice and pursuing justice and serving the poor, 
then, you know, according to this, um, you know, we don't have a pure and undefiled religion before God. So, um, so that's, you know, something to call us all higher in terms of, you know, what we're doing um, with our time again. Um, the next thing, number five, riches and pleasure. So in two, chapter two, verses one to three, it says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that I also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards, made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I, brought, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So he tried entertainment, you know. Um, so today, you know, we, we don't necessarily have, you know, our own singers that we, although maybe you hired a band for your wedding or something like that. But um you know netflix right i mean if if you are trying to keep up with all the latest series of netflix good luck they they come out fast and furiously um you know maybe it's uh alcohol or you know maybe it's partying or maybe it's um you know maybe it's medicating yourself with with alcohol after a hard day and just zoning out or something like that right maybe it's um Maybe it's your, you know, your house, you know, your house is so important to you and um, you're always got new projects in your house. Maybe it's all, maybe you're all about savings and investments, right? You're that financial guru and, but you put a lot of hope in your, um, in your money, right? Maybe you have it and you're always trying to find more of it and earn more. Maybe it's relationships, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you put your um, your meaning in your your friends and in your um, you know pursuing relationships and stuff. And again, if if we have God and we're putting God first, then all of these things, all of these things on that list, can be blessings and can be gifts and can be enjoyed. Um, but if we're trying to find our ultimate meaning from those things, uh, we are going to be sadly disappointed um this is a scripture that i have always loved luke 16 9 it says i tell you use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings so you know all the things on that list there could kind of be considered in some way as worldly wealth because they're basically gifts right and um if we use those things you know maybe it's your house if you use that to be hospitable and have friends over, have your neighbors over, right? Then all those projects that you're doing, you can say, hey, this is just to make my house more, you know, welcoming to my neighbors and my friends. And, you know, I'm trying to encourage people from my small group or whatever, right? Um, your money, right? You can, you can use that to, you know, have your friends over, right? You have to Maybe have a nicer meal than you normally would so that you can, you know, have your friends over to dinner. Um, but again, all those things, if we uh, if we use them, um, can be definitely blessings if we use them for God. 
Um, and then the last one is death. Okay, I left I left the the hardest one to last. Right, death. We all love to think about death, right? Um, but hopefully after this, you won't mind thinking about it as much, right? So chapter three, verses 18 to 22, he says, I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are, they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animals goes down into the earth? So I saw that there's nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after that? So again, if you pull this scripture out of the whole Bible and you know build a religion on it, it's going to be like a weird religion, right? Um, because it's saying here, like, yeah, basically, you know, we're just like animals. Um, and, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, very humanistic idea. Um, a lot of scientists think that, right? But um, so the Kohela sees death as the end, right? Man has no advantage over animals, will just return back to dust. And um, so why not just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? And you know, honestly, that's what a lot of people, you know, that's pretty much, again, that YOLO, right? You only live once. Um, mentality is, yeah, just have all the fun you can now because, you know, you're going to be food for worms. So have fun. Um, but in Isaiah chapter 25, 6 to 9, it says, and this is a great scripture. Um, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So clearly from this passage, death is actually not the end, right? God will swallow up death forever. Christians do not need to fear death. Um, so you can rejoice in your salvation, it says. Um, and as we do that, we can bring a little bit of heaven to earth. So I just want to, um, in summary, um, remember, a lot of these passages that just kind of like make you say, huh, um, like the one we just read, right? Man and animal, same thing, um, must be read in the context to the rest of the Bible. And I know Bobby's going to do a great job next week of kind of like putting the stuff that I've said and sort of giving it even more context in terms of the, you know, the whole book. And then, of course, the end of the book um, is, you know, is, is really going to give context to even, uh, even more so to what I've talked about today. So don't miss that. Um, Everything is meaningless apart from God. And that goes for non-Christians and Christians, right? If um, non-Christians don't have God, they try to fill their life with things that, you know, they try to find meaning, they're going to find it meaningless. But as Christians, if we try to fill our lives with those same things and try to find meaning, meaning from those things, um, we are not going to be having the, the, the type of life that God intended us to have. Um, God gives everything meaning. We all have a God-shaped hole that can only be filled by God through his Holy Spirit. And we can use God's gifts to glorify him. You know, all those things that people try to make meaning, um, if we use them as gifts from God to glorify him, they can be awesome. And lastly, and probably most importantly, death has no power over God's children. Um, so next week 
is class three in our series. It's called Godly Wisdom and Worldly Wisdom. Um, Tuesday, October 4th at 7.30, Bobby Ritter, um, back to the A-team. And um, so we will definitely be looking forward to that, uh, that class next week. So thank you so much for, um, for listening. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and you realize that there was a time to listen to this class. And um, I hope you have a great uh, rest of your week. See you guys probably tomorrow night. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to make any announcements or, but I will stop sharing my screen here. And, and Neil, if you have a few minutes, are, are you good with, in case anyone has any questions? Um, yeah. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just, I'll, I'll pass it over to Bobby Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> Because I mean, he was coming up with the answers last week. I gotta tell you, I, I had no idea what any of the answers to those questions you guys were asking were. So, anyway, but yeah, go ahead. You can try. Oh, I guess there's no questions. Uh, no. Well, I, I just, I just wanted to say again, um, thank you so much. Um, just like last week. Um, I really feel inspired, you know, by what you shared, you know, and, um, you know, I so appreciate, you know, the work that you guys are, you know, have put into this. And um, it's just so encouraging to think about it and the way that you presented it, you know, everything is meaningless apart from God. And it's so true that, you know, when you're in contact, you know, with God's spirit and you allow yourself to feel thankful when you're looking at something it's so much more rewarding than if you're looking at it and feeling not thankful. So it sort of translates into what you were saying to us. And um, so it's very rich and powerful and wise. So again, you know, like Bobby last week, you've given us, you know, more wisdom than we had before. Thank Amen. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. I, I... I didn't, I didn't really um, emphasize that idea of being thankful. That's such a great point, you know, being thankful for the gifts rather than even just seeing them. So great. Thanks, Maxine, for that addition. Yeah, so, I mean, questions or comments um, anybody has is, is great. I like what you shared about the inheritance. As I was reading, I was like, wow, you know, you work and you toil. <laughs> And then who's going to get what you do? And I was thinking about my nieces and my family. <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know. And then you said, you know what? You have an inheritance from God. So that really, um, that, that helped me a lot in my thinking. Amen. So thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks again, Neil. Um, Really appreciate it. You you did this class with us on Sunday. Uh, That's right. Right. I did it. I did a focus group. Focus group at, right, uh, right, during right. small group on Sunday. That's right. <laughs> right. So it was uh, really enjoyed it, and um, especially you know when when you gave us that practical about uh, really how to be. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit is what quenches us. Right. It's what fills us. Um, nothing else in life will really fill us. You know, before BC, before Christ, we were never filled by things. And um, we can fall into that trap again. Uh, but you, but this point, you know, somehow, some way, that's what I got from the lesson is that uh, the Holy Spirit is what will quench me, is what will fill me. And yeah, I think you went through the Ephesians a passage in Ephesians about the practicals for what to do uh, to be filled. So, and relating that to, to Ecclesiastes, you know, when we pursue different things, we, we really will never be filled, just like whoever the author is, you know, after having all those projects and, and all those things in his life, uh, he was never, he found it to be mean, meaningless in the end. So, um, Anyway, so that, that's it. I appreciate the lesson, Neil. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Dave.
Yeah, Neil, this is Gloria. Hi, thank you so Hi, very much. It's really, really um, inspiring as uh, <clears throat> was said, and as Maxine said, you know, with um, Bobby last week and then bringing it forward to this week and just being reminded each time to um, read God's word in context, mm -hmm. you know, because it's so easy to take one scripture and you can even start a whole new religion, you know, but, yeah. but just taking mm -hmm. it in context. So I really like the back and forth that you did, the old, the new, you know, to help us to see the context of the scripture, what God uh, really intended for us to see and do. And, um, and especially about the gifts, you know, to even though he's talking about meaningless, meaningless, you know, you could hear that. But well, what's the point, you know, but to understand that God wants us to enjoy life. In fact, Jesus says he came so that we could live life to the full um, with God. You know, that's the way mm -hmm. I see it with God. I can live life to the full if I'm understanding that those gifts and everything around me is from God. It's a gift, you know, and I'm not to worship those things, but to worship God and be thankful for the gifts. So thank you so very much. I'm glad you mentioned that scripture because I had meant to put that in, like, you know, oh, Jesus came to give his life true. and give it to the full. So thank you so wow. much for bringing that. That's awesome. Awesome. Amen. Holy Spirit, right? That's amen. right. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Amen. Um, Neil, I just wanted to make one comment. Um, I'm very grateful for these classes. Um, these, a lot of the scriptures you shared tonight, I remember reading when I was a really baby Christian mm -hmm. and, you know, and I just found them to be pro so profound. And I think, I, I think what I was left with from this class was that I'm at a stage of life now where I'm thinking about retirement. I'm thinking about, you know, all, all the things that you were kind of referring to throughout the class. And it just left me inspired to make sure I'm thinking about what am I gonna leave behind that is of God? And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so making sure that I am really thinking even more so about that than about, you know, the financial stuff or the, you know, the, the physical things. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Um, and all of the teachers that are teaching these classes, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really, it definitely helping me to, dig deeper. Um, so thank you so much for the time and effort you all are putting into these classes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's some great points there. Excellent. Amen. Well, Neil, thank you. Thank you so much again. Oh, sorry, Beverly, was it? No, 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 I'm done. <laughs> But yeah, Neil, thank you so much. Uh, just incredible job. And we're so, so grateful that you spent the time with us uh, this evening. So thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we'll see you back at, at 730. And, and like I said, hopefully we'll be able to get the uh, our other recording issue resolved so we can bolt them online. Thanks okay. all. Amen. Thank good night. Yeah, thank you so much. Have, Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Neil.